Hello everyone, and welcome to today's webinar on practical model-based approaches for phase one oncology trials. This is the third webinar in our new introductory webinar series on complex innovative trial designs. We encourage everyone to stay around to the end of the webinar where we will review the schedule of upcoming webinars in the series. I am pleased to introduce our presenter today. Dr. Sadrajit Rachadri is a senior director and a member of Statistical Research and Innovation Group in Pfizer. He has over 12 years of extensive experience in working with different phases of clinical trials. His primary expertise includes implementation of innovative statistical methodology in clinical trials. He has co-authored several publications and book chapters in this area and provided statistical training in major conferences. His area of research includes survival analysis, use of model-based approaches and Bayesian methods in clinical trials. Satrajit was a recipient of a Young Statistical Scientist Award from the International Indian Statistical Association in 2019. It is now my pleasure to turn it over to Satrajit. Thank you, Elisa, uh, for the nice introduction. And uh, thank you, Saitil, for um, offering me the opportunity to present this interesting topic um, to, to the audience. And thank you, everybody, for your time to join um, the webinar today. So today I will I will go through um, some of the very basics of the of the um, oncology phase one design and trying to get into some how one can really implement a model based approach into this setting to making a better uh, statistical inference or better and and as well as a better decision making. So a quick disclaimer. Um, it's uh, whatever I speak is it's uh, my responsibility, and this this not necessarily goes to Pfizer, and uh, um, and anything that you have a question on or doubt on, please throw it up on me. So here is uh, the the draft agenda of the talk. Before I move on, I definitely want to want to mention that the, the talk I'm going to go through or the material that I'm going through, it's about, it's a work of many years for many statisticians across different companies they are in now. And, and it has been a collective effort by statisticians, clinicians, and management all together to bring it in a practical zone. And of course, at the end of the slide, I will acknowledge some of the key players and uh, of this uh, who, whom I worked with over the time to make it happen. Uh, so I begin with uh, oncology phase one. The, just an introduction of oncology phase one design. The, some, if some of you are not familiar with it, this is a very quick uh, layout how that design looks like, and what really the target we look for in such a design. And then we come into the ch the, the traditional designs that has been most frequently used, and what are the caveats of that. We followed up with that. What are the need of Bayesian statistics to make this better? And then I will go through one practical model-based approach among many that exist, scientifically solid, and along with the case studies and some practical consideration and summaries. So without any further delay, I just wanted to start with uh, the introduction to oncology phase one. As you, many of you know that in oncology, we have a little bit different situation in phase one compared to other therapeutic area where we need to use patients rather than healthy volunteers. And not only patients, they're really sick patients mostly, the patients who have failed almost all available therapies. So uh, you, have a, you, you have a pretty treatment resistant patient that you are looking for. And that's why, and, and we are primarily look at, this is the first time this at, at, uh, compound is tested in a human level. So these are typically called first in human trial as well for oncology. And so we, we in order to make sure that the drug and the compound is safe to the person, we gradually increase the doses. And safety is the primary endpoint. And we wanted to determine what is the maximum dose that patient can tolerate. That's more or less the main focus or sometime optimal biological dose, a dose that actually active. So it depends. Most of our old oncology paradigm, the small molecule paradigm, determination of MTD remain the, the mostly important endpoints. But recently, with many of the new biologics, we have seen some shift to move from MTD to biologics as well. But for today, we focus on MTD, but similar, other amendment can be done with, with, with adaptation to the similar design. 
but we also look for different thing with this small uh, this one thing you have to understand this is a very small trial we try to look for and we have a long shopping list to look to, to look here because we'll jump into either a small phase 2 then uh, with an expansion cohort and then we jump to a phase 3 so we really try to use as much information as possible in this from this small trial so we need to look into what kind of regimens may be optimal what kind of population may be better here or some preliminary efficacy signals if the drug is actually working so those are also some secondary endpoints people keep in mind when oncology phase 1 trials are typically designed so here is how a typical oncology phase 1 design is done so you start with a dose level typically you look at, based on your preclinical pre data you you look into a dose which is safe to start basically pretty low uh, doses in general to make sure the patient's uh, patient safety. You st you put a small number of patients there. You follow them and dose them th throughout on that time, and and you follow them with a fixed amount of time. Uh, the, there are the windows depends on the half life and the other properties of the compound. Uh, one of the for small molecules we have mostly seen 28 days or kind of a four weeks type of windows in general, but that varies on 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 different setting. So once you look into that patient during the dosing, each of each of this cohort of three or six patients, you try to see if any of them has a dose limiting toxicity. Dose limiting toxicity means uh, the, the toxicities for if 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 that occurs to a patient, you cannot dose them anymore. So that's why they call dose limiting toxicity. If the patient has dose limiting toxicity, that means a safety alarm there. And doses are increased if you don't see such a thing or if things are safe. And then uh, in typically what happens in this type of trials, you uh, after one cohort is finished, you typically call a uh, dose escalation meeting, which includes the clinician, principal investigator, statistician, pharmaco pharmaco uh, scientists, and a biomarker to all the key players of the trial, and they try to decide based on the available data what would be the possible next dose. And then you continue like this for the next cohorts. When you see a, a safety signal, you also decide do you want to stay there or do you want to go down. All these decisions are made collectively based on uh, discussions in this dose escalation thesis. But as you can see, for when we try to design this trial, there are a few fundamental challenges that we have to face here. First, we are looking for an unt untested drug to a really sick patient. Second is, with a small cohort of patients, we still have to get some way and, and reasonably accurate MTD. Then you ca these trials cannot be really big because most of the time it, it, there's a budget constraint, also ethical constraint, that you don't know uh, how many, uh, how good the drug is, or how safe the drug is, putting too many patients at the very beginning, and uh, is, is is unethical as well. And from efficacy point of view, also putting too many patients onto the lower and unefficacious dose is also there's an ethical concern. Then there's the the huge problem is we don't know the safety profile, and and there is a possibility of high toxicity can be seen in patient as dose increases. And of course, we all know that these trials, given all this constraint, it has to be completed in a timely manner in order to continue. Uh, because these patients are sick, people, the, the investigator cannot hold these patients for a long time. And as well as uh, to move the development forward, you need to do things on a on a, on a uh, timely manner. So good. So while, when we think about design, there are few feet factors we need to consider. The first is. Okay, we have a small dose cohort at each of these these dose levels that we have to make our decision or inference on. So that is our the 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 the, the criteria. So three to six patients, and it better to be if we can be flexible. That instead of having one fixed number three or four, can we have a little liberty like three to six? So. Then we need a robust estimation of MTD. At least we need a reasonably rich MTD using our design scheme. And definitely the safety first. So we cannot put too much patient in a toxic dose level where we start to see toxicities. The design should not allow to put more patient there. And given we are dealing with also similarly, if there is the dose is subtherapeutic, you should not put more patient there either in that way. 
and then use of all we are trying to use all patient in all the information so informations are not only DLG, all the relevant information that you have in this trial, not, and not only one dose level where you are testing right now, rather all the data that you collected over time that can be used to make a better decision. So when we said all type of information, we meant three type of information. First is when you start the trial, especially on a single agent, you may have a preclinical information you try to leverage that as well based on the similarity as much as possible in clinically relevance. Then if, you have a, if you're looking for a drug combination study, definitely you want to leverage the single agent toxicity information that you have from single agent trial in order to make the design more efficient on that way because combinations are even more complicated because instead of one, uh, instead of one line of escalation, now you're basically escalating over two dimensions. Then Instead of, whereas of current practice is always looking into the current on one DLT, I mean, kind of a one dose level where you are testing right now, it's rather the more efficient ways to use all the dose toxicity that data that you have observed, which needs a little bit more thinking and a relationship we have to build up between dose toxicity in order to use them. And finally, and, and it's last and not the least, you need to consider other other safety consideration like grade three, four, two, three toxicities, PKPD data, efficacy information, other things. So a decision should, a dose decision to the next level should not only rely on this DLT, but it's only DLT plays a part of it, but it should be a collective action based on all the inf all this information. So what we are looking for very quickly, that what kind of statistical inference we are talking here. So I, before I move on to this, I just wanted to clarify a difference first. The, the model or all the, the methods that we talk about in, in, in these different statistical papers or different methodologies, we mainly talk about statistical inference. That means we try to say, based on the data, what is my chance of DLTs are. So suppose I am here, I have seen some DLT in my dose level and other dose level. What is the probability that my the current dose is safe or the next dose is safe? So the statistical models or any techniques that we look for is do that inference. But decision is one more step up. So when you take a decision, inference is a part of that. So model never recommend a dose or it only does it gives you a quantitative risk assessment of different dose level. But when you make a decision about a dose, it must be collecting using all data, like other consideration, safety, PK, and all things together. So just I wanted to mention that this terminology that people collectively use, that model recommends dose, it's somehow confusing, and that's one of the red limiting factors of using this model, because model never recommend dose. It just do an assessment of how safe or how unsafe different doses are. And, and then we take that into the, to do a better decision making. Now we move into the main, uh, the, the interesting design part of this presentation. So we start with what are the traditional designs does, what are the current designs, and what are the main caveats of that? So we, as we have seen the experiences, though the, uh, we have seen a lot and lot of methodological paper in statistical literature, but unfortunately in real life, still the designs are pretty non-statistical. And uh, the design that's dominate is mostly algorithmic design like three plus three, or uh, some more sophisticated algorithm like three plus three plus three or six plus six, different variations of that which unfortunately doesn't have a statistical uh, inference in it. And I'm gonna explain you why it is in a moment. So here is an example how three plus three works. So in three plus three, you basically, so you first at the design, you fixed your dose levels. So you have, you decide dose level one to two to three to four. So each has to go stepwise. And for at one dose level, you put first three patient. If you see no DLT, you can go up on a highest dose level, which is if that's not tested earlier. If you have seen one DLT, you basically put three more patient into that. And out of that, if you see more DLT, if you see no DLT, you can still go up if the upper dose level is uh, untested. 
or you can because you have minimum six in a patient already you can even declare mtd at that level and if you see a more than one dlt out of the next cohort of three patient one or more uh, you basically uh, decide to go down or uh, and 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 test the lower dose level and if you see two out of three dose level basically any dose level up above than that are kind of an abandon that moment. You basically come down and you uh, test the lower dose level or or and and try to and and test them and or you can declare MTD if you have six patients already at the lower dose level. Let's have an example quickly. What I mean. So look into this uh, simple example where you have five dose levels. So you started with 45. There was nothing. Uh, then you went, so you see no DLT, so the, the design says, you okay, you can move up, and you went to 60, and then uh, you saw one DLT out of that. And then once you saw that, you basically go back to the scheme and you put three more patients into this. You saw nothing, so one out of six, so it allows you to go up to 75. And then you basically uh, see nothing, you went up, and you declare you saw a huge number two out of three DLT there. That's basically abandon your design. You can, any those level ninety and above. So you have to come down, and you basically have to do a three more patient into this dose level seventy five. You saw one out of three there. Uh, you decided okay, I have six patient enrolled. My number of DLT is less than or equal to one, so I can declare MTD at seventy five. So this looks simple, but what's the problem here? The problem is you are basically only relying on the point estimate. That means you're only relying that one out of three or two out of three sort of giving you the true DLT rate. You are, what you are totally ignoring is the uncertainty. So what is the chance that your dose may be good, but by chance you have observed something so bad, like two out of three. Here is an example quickly, that if you have a bad dose level, which is true DLT rate of 50%, definitely not good. But if you repeat that experiment, 11% of time you can see a good case, like zero or one DLT out of six patients. On the other hand, if you have a good dose, like 16.6 .6 toxicity, where you really want to go further there, there is a chance of 26% time that you can see such a worst case, like two or more DLTs. So by only looking into the point estimate, you are totally ignoring this uncertainty into, into, into your design, and you are penalizing yourself in some way. And that's what it says. It doesn't, then it doesn't satisfy its good D principle, and you basically being too much conservative in declaring your MTDs. And then, of course, here, the other problem is your cohort size. So instead of three, if you put four patients, this algorithm doesn't work. You have to redone the algorithm to find how to handle that one extra patient. So it's, it, that's why it's pretty ad hoc, because the main reason is you are, there is no statistical proper inference or, or, or any assessment of uncertainty is done at that moment. So that was the main caveat, why three plus three was always remain a problem. And I mean, there is a huge statistical literature exists in clinic, clinical and, and, and all areas declaring uh, how bad 3 plus 3 is. But unfortunately, this has still been used quite a while. So how can we take, take care of that? How can we improve now? So what we are missing here? So we are missing that, I mean, in, if I have a 0 out of 1, what I'm not looking, even I saw zero, 1 out of 3, what is the probability that if I put three more patients there, I would not see something like two out of three? So this kind of assessment we are not doing in this. Or if I observe two out of three, if what is the chance that if I put three more patients into that dose level, maybe I observe something not that as bad as this. So this kind of uncertainties are somehow missing in this statement. So one way to assess that is using the Bayesian statistics. So using Bayesian statistics is a very normal way to do it because it, can, so the good power of Bayesian is it take the prior knowledge. It's basically, so whatever you available, so your preclinical data, your expert knowledge, say how the toxicity looks like. So for a specific dose, how the toxicity looks like when the trial begins. Then you observe the data 
and it learned from there it says okay so based on that here is my probability that i have a good dose or here is my probability i have a bad dose so which is a instead of having one point estimate just assigned to we rather go into a full fledged probability risk assessment which is a much better metric or much interpretable metric to look for or even it can also help you to assess if you put three or four more patient into this cohort what is the risk that you may observe something really bad so this kind of assessments which are the key questions i i always find when we went to a dose escalation tc with non statistician can be answered in the bayesian framework let's take an example how what i mean here so in order to do a right assessment of safety we need to first do think about what a good or a bad dose is so in a in a typically target uh, so my most of the talk today is specific to the uh, to to looking to the uh, targeted agent i mean our single molecules uh, so, um or looking into small molecules so what we typically do we look into three sort of intervals there so first interval is under dosing so that means the toxicity is less than 16% that means most likely the drug is not doing much there then we look into the target dosing where basically our main focus are and based on the clinical literature and also if you look on the 3 plus 3 design right the belief the clinical belief is the dose is uh, an active dose lies somewhere between when the toxicity is 1/6 to 1/3 so we use that so that's what we are targeting on that a toxicity is between 1/6 to 1/3 and then anything beyond 33% so more than one out of three toxicities is basically uh, an overdosing so we definitely want to avoid putting more patient if i have a high probability of being there so that's what now we are talking about more on a, of a probabilistic target that what we are looking for and then at any dose level based on the data we try to assess what are these probabilities and and make our decision based on that so one first step to that was the use of modified toxicity interval or mtpi which is a pretty simple bayesian design which is a little improvement towards the uh the algorithmic design like 3 plus 3 where you still have the step up and down type of design as we have seen there uh but we have actually allowed a more inference probabilistic inference rather than using only the one out of three or two out of three such a point estimate so basically it you based on every mom for each cohort level you put number of patient and that don't need to be three because we are using a statistical inference now it can be any size and then based on that we decide do we want to stay we want to escalate or we want to deescalate and they are main mainly mostly based on a quantity called unit probability mass and i'm coming into that in a moment so how that works so basically you you take for one dose level you put n number of patient n can be any number between 3 to 6 or even higher but we typically in practice we have seen uh, 3 out of 6 3 to 6 in general and then we look into what is the what its probability that it can belong to under dose interval so what given the data what is the chance that i may be into this under dosing interval what is the chance that i may be in target interval that in a better in a good interval basically and i look into the chance that i the safety may be questionable because i the chance it was the overdose interval and, and in order to make a fair comparison it has been normalized by the length of the interval so the design is still pretty simple based on if if upm is max for the underdose level it allows you to go up if you your upm is max to the target level it ask you to put more patient into the uh, into the target in, into that dose if you already met the mtd criteria minimum number of patient you can declare mtd even but if you see more the upm is highest towards the um or to towards the overdose toxicity definitely there is a safety signal so you need to come down so but just mind that it still just using the current dose data for inference so it's not using what happened in previous cohort 
in order to make your inference now. So you can only escalate, escalate to one level because there is no model at this moment to link the dose toxicity relationship. And there are many uh, efficient um, uh, modifications are available like MTPI2, Boyan, Pipe, and there are many more. Uh, very efficient type of algorithms put in there. So just to give you an example quickly how that works. So you start with basically, I'm suppose I'm at a dose level. So how I analyze that. So I stop, I, I, based on the pre, I don't have a preclinical data or I just have a expert guess that, okay, my true DLT of that dose level is around 25%. But as I don't have any information, I keep my prior non-informative. That means I just assume a wide possibility there so that uh, the data can in upload, update, update that even. So then I, if you see the 90% interval, it can actually go from 0 to 95%. So it's pretty wide. Now I see something safe. And as long as it is safe, the model updates. The data is basically, this is the prior, which is pretty flat. And the model update the probabilities, the probability of true toxicity. And if you see that, it's saying that, okay, you are safe here. And you, the probability of underdosing or the UPM for underdosing seems to be maximum. So you can go up to the next dose level at this moment. So now you see this assessment is instead of having a point estimate, like one out of six, we are actually looking into this point interval. But one thing to note, that given your data is so safe, you still have like 17% chance that you can be on overdose. So uncertainties of the sparse data has to be considered. I mean, so just ha having one out of six doesn't tell you you have a safe dose. You need to look into this metric in order to understand what is the probability that you have a safe dose. So MTPI is a nice, extension to coming from 3 plus. It's a, it's a long way forward to look into a better, a proper statistical inference now. But, uh, and it, it allows to do a probabilistic statement about true DLT. It, it tells you, okay, my true, what is the probability my true, true DLT lies between 0 to 16% or 16 to 33% or more than 33%, which is the overdosing. So it gives you such a probability metrics or risk metric to make your decision. And it allows flexible cohort sizes as well. But still, the, the issue is it still don't allow you to use all the information. So that means you still are using just the information for that one cohort. You are not using information from previous cohort yet because you don't, uh, you don't have a dose toxicity relationship at this moment. And then your dose levels are fixed. You cannot, because you're, it's, it's still an algorithm go step by step. So you cannot really adopt and dose a, to say that you can add a new dose or, or a, take a new dose out or, or skip a dose. Those kind of options are still not available because it, it doesn't tell you right currently that what the, based on my current data, how the future doses are look like because you don't have such a relationship at this moment which drags us to the next level, and we try to see what can we do better now. So in order to do that better, we need a simplistic model that can model our dose toxicity data at every moment of the dose escalation thesis. So as you can already understand, the data is coming sequentially. I mean, you have the first cohort, second cohort, third cohort, so data are coming sequentially, and so, it's a very natural framework for Bayesian to update. And how can we update it further that basically we have a, a, a relationship assumption which can tell us, okay, given the current data, how my all the, the dose levels look like? I mean, can I put myself, so I, ha I have dose one, two, three, four. So I, I have seen extremely safe data in one, two. Can I skip three and test four at this moment? Or I have seen something uh, really bad at those level four. Can I come back to three and see if things are extremely safe? Can I come back to four once again? Because the, unfortunately, the previous, including MTPI, doesn't do, do the, this extrapolation because it doesn't have a model. So you really need uh, this kind of flexibility in order to make your design further optimal and to use all the information available. And there are other flexibilities you can as well as explore 
multiple dose level at the same time. So two dose level can be explored if they are safe based on the current data and, and they both are of clinical interest, then they can be explored on the same level and same time and try to make a overall inference. Because it's always, now we, are, we have a model, we have a likelihood, we, we can actually incorporate all this data at the same time. And this was actually one of the, the beautiful thing my old colleagues, and, and this also publicly available, one colleagues looked at how to schematically represent that, the, whole, the overall uh, decision-making process in the, in, in, in the phase one. If you look into that, all the, the, the talk today, we are mainly talking about this part of the model. So the DLT rates, all the model approach, all we are talking about is the DLT rate, but a decision has to combine all other data together, like clinical expertise, additional data in order to make the decision. All we are trying to use this model to make that decision more, uh, make that, giving them more information in order to make a better decision. So now I come back to a very, uh, what kind of model? So we said, okay, we use a model. What kind of model we can use? So there is already an there's, there's many many model exist in 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 the in uh, in statistical literature. I mean this 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 is a huge literature, and I'm not today uh, in 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 any the purpose of today is discussing which model is better than other or which is not. Uh, the today my main focus is how can we implement any one of these model based approach successfully in a practical trial. And what is really missing in order to do that? What we need to do as a statistician? Why, given we have such an enriched research, people are still on these three plus three designs and other designs. So that's the main focus we are looking for. As uh, Dr. George Box says, that all models are wrong, but some are useful. So we are not really that what model, the talk, the purpose is not the looking into the best model, but rather an approach that can be how to use that in a practical purpose. So today I'm going to focus on Bayesian logistic uh, regression model. That was my most experience on. That was I worked on both in my previous job in Novartis and now in Pfizer. So what we assume there is very simple. We just assume that the toxicity and the dose has a logistic relationship. So don't worry about the mathematical notations. They are not important that much for, for everybody. Just to, just to understand the data we have is a number of patient, number of DLT out of number of patient. The, the same setup we have seen in previous setting. The only thing we are adding up, previously we don't have any relationship between pi D of adjacent doses. So if you have a dose level D1 and D2, previously we assume no relationship between them. So now we are assuming a relationship between pi D1 and pi D2. That's basically a logistic regression model. So that means uh, the, the odds of DLT, log odds of DLT depends on log of dose. And the beauty of this is parameters can be easily interpreted, whereas alpha is basically the log odds at the reference dose. The reference dose is basically normalization that you do for uh, regression in, 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 in many regression settings. And, and as we are using a normal um, Bayesian model, definitely we need a prior so we use a bivariate normal prior for alpha and beta, log alpha and beta. And interpretation of alpha and, and beta is basically the increase in DLT uh, risk with an increase of a dose. So it's very simple uh, inter in, 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 in interpretation wise. And the beauty of it, then if we have an expert opinion, like if people say, okay, my reference dose is my MTD, and I assume that, okay, that would, and so I can assume that, okay, my prior mean is around logit of 33%. So I can easily do such a thing uh, using, use the clinical knowledge into this statistical model by you, because it, the whole interpretation is very intuitive in that manner. And at the end of the day, what we look for, so once we uh, do this analysis, we look for the DLT rates at these different intervals, that what is the probability based on the current data of my true DLT is on the underdosing interval, target toxicity, and overdosing interval. And also, uh, we look into the prediction part, that what is the chance of seeing bad, so one or more, uh, one, 
more than one DLT if I put three more new patients into a dose level. So those kind of metric actually it helps us to make a dis comprehensive decision making. But of course we have to put some constraint that what doses we should we should not go. I mean, so the model never tells you what dose to go. We basically present these summaries to the a clinical team and make them the decision so that allow them to make the decision based on this information along with the other safety information. All we but we definitely tell them which doses are look risky based on the current data. And the way to do that is to use a criteria called escalation with overdose control. So that means if my chance of overdosing based on the current data is more than 25%, definitely we don't want to go there. I mean, maybe it's good to avoid those. And this 25%, I have seen other calibration of 35%, how aggressive one wants to be. But... Uh, I, I mean, uh, the, the original your criteria, we stick to the 25%, but there are variations based on how aggressive team wants to be in terms of the escalation. But this matrix actually put in to, to uh, tell you that, okay, these are the dose level which is raising a red flag that you may not want to go. Just to quickly touch, because we, talk, we are doing Bayesian and many of our statistical colleagues knows how to choose priors, and, and this model-based approach actually allows you to incorporate the available information into the prior. If you don't have any information, like the example we are going to see in a moment, you can assume a weekly informative prior, as we did for other examples previously, right? We didn't have any information, so we assume a pretty wide prior that goes 0 to 95%. So we, we actually assume a prior for alpha, log alpha, log beta, so that the dose toxicities are pretty wide in, in each dose level. If we have some data, especially uh, if we have, uh, if this happens, I have seen when we are planning for a Japanese dose escalation TC, and we try to use the data from the Western cohort, uh, the Western population, uh, often we try to use that data and we try to discount definitely because there are, um, be there are between trial heterogeneities, between population heterogeneities, we need to discount it to so allow for more extreme to happen. And that can be done using a meta-analytic predictive prior. I don't go to details of those technicalities. That can be a, I mean, it, it can be a topic of itself and for a webinar, how to use meta-analytic. But this is, it is a technique of using Bayesian hierarchical model to derive an informative prior, which can save a sample, bring information from previous, informa previous trials to make your trial more efficient. And if you believe that, there is a possibility that my current trial look a little bit, there's a possibility that look different from the historical data. There is a way to use a mixture prior in order to robustify that. Now come to the, the little bit operational points as well, right? Because we, we have to write protocol. So the protocol, how it looks, previously we know it was simple. We can say, if I have one out of six, I can declare my MTD. So here also we have to state the MTD rule very clearly. And one way to do that, and there may be different ways, that you put at least a, the at least minimum number of patients need to be treated. That can be six and nine based on the the resource that you have, or how many uh, how confident you are about the data that you have seen based on the other things. And then also you at least your probability of target is uh, is quite good, like fifty percent or sixty percent at least. I mean we target sometimes sixty percent at least or the patient number of patients in the study already crosses your budget limit. So that's how we typically put it there. And we definitely one needs to include an operating characteristic that if you are assuming a true toxicity curve, which is aligned, not aligned with assumption, how, many, how often uh, your MTD is detected at a target dose level and uh, how often you are putting patients into the unsafe cohort. So this kind of metrics need to be evaluated. And then one of the very important thing is because I think operating characteristics in phase one studies are somehow informative, but the problem is there are too many scenarios can be possible. So, and that cannot be completely evaluated. We can evaluate some possibilities, but not all. But hypothetic is those scenarios which non-statisticians understand much better that, okay, just tell me I am at this dose level and I observed zero out of three. Can this model allow me, so it doesn't recommend, can it allow me to go up 
or it's, it will tell me, okay, I cannot go. And I observe really something bad, like two out of three. Does this model still allow me to go up? If those kind of, so it has to be, the model has to be implemented in a way so that the, the decisions are clinically relevant there. These models can be further extended and can be extended for a uh, combination setting. I'm, I'm not going to go into that details. And there are many other number of settings one can go into. So I quickly want to go for next 10 minutes. I just wanted to, next five, 10 minutes, I want to go through with you a case study, which is a first in human study using this model-based approach. So you are looking for an MTD and your provisional dose level that you specify on a protocol are this uh, six dose levels starting from 33.3 and 800. Based on your preclinical data that you assume your uh, MTD is expected somehow 600 to 800. So you take your D star to be at 800, and you assume that you have around 33% um, chance there. But you allow a large uncertainty. So this is because I don't have enough information. We basically put a uh, weekly informative prior there. And this is how we visually do it. So the plot on the left is basically the, the mean and the, and the credible intervals, so 90% Bayesian intervals. So that basically says how my toxicity looks based on my prior assumptions, which says they are very vague, so it can go anywhere from 0 to 80% for starting dose level. And for higher dose level, it can go anyhow from 0 to 1. So it's pretty, I'm not really assuming any strong relationship based on the prior. And the, the one on the right is basically a nice layout of probability of underdosing, target, and overdosing. The one on the top is basically saying my probability of being on 33 to 1%. If it's crossed 25%, the color would be changed to red so that you know that these dose levels are problematic. So based on the prior, I can start at 30. So based on the preclinical knowledge, 33.3 .3 is a pretty safe dose. One can even start higher, but this clinical team actually decided to uh, go, uh, this, this clinical team decided to uh, be safe and start with a lowest dose level possible. So they start the dose escalation. Until 100 milligram, things were very fine and they have seen no toxicities. The model was reacting accordingly and it's actually allowing me to easily go up. I mean, it just says, okay, you can go up. Of course, other data is in consideration. Like at this moment, uh, team can even go choose dose level like th like 300. But typically in a dose escalation trial, we do not allow escalation more than 100% uh, because that's kind of an FDA requirement that we, we constrain ourselves within 100%. But we have seen some other agent even where we have seen certain exceptions where more jumps are allowed. So the model doesn't restrict you to do any jump. It just gives you the probabilistic assessment. The other the decisions are based on all the other possibilities, safety possibilities that are a discussion of the team. Now we put page three patient into the dose level 200 and we start to see something. So the model become conservative and it's, it's telling me, okay, you have seen something, so why don't you put, wait a little bit to 200 and, and try that dose level a little bit before you go up. And so we put some more dose patients there and we see the dose levels are fine. So then it allows you to go up further. And you see, one can even go from 200 to 400 here. But the team, as they have seen some toxicity at 200, decided to go safely because we are close to MTD. We are thinking 600 to 800. And there are other safety considerations in, comes into this picture as well. 300 remained good. And then the team went to 400. Once they went to 400, they have start seeing two out of three. So if we would have been doing a three plus three, that's basically end of all above those levels, basically. You have seen two out of three, you can't go up, you have to come down. So the model is giving a clinically sensible recommendation that you have seen something, you cannot stay there, you have to come down and retest a lower dose level. And we did that. Once we did a reasonable cohort within zero to six and retested that, and, and saw everything is safe, the model says, why don't you go up and 
maybe you test this 400 dose level again because two out of three might be a chance only. And once we do that, we see something is really good there. We put a six or eight patient there and we saw things looks very good. And, and, and if you would have used your three plus three traditional design, you have been done with your upper dose level starting from 400. Then we further continue to put more patients and we, when we put the dose level was good, the model was conservative because they have seen something, but they allowed you to explore an intermediate dose level. See, in a 3 plus 3 dose level, if you cannot go or, or empty MTPI, you kind of an end up there. If you cannot go up, you either declare MTD there or you stop or you have to go down. But here, you can at least also explore the intermediate dose levels on the same time. And once people look into that and saw some DLT, they decided maybe we stay up to that level and declare an MTD at dose level 600. So this, so all this example that goes through here, it basically shows the flexibility you have in terms of cohort size, in terms of decision making, retesting those levels, looking into intermediate dose levels, which are not possible in other approaches which are not model based as such. But of course, when you do such a protocol, there is no free lunches, right? I mean, you need to do a, a good planning. You need a good discussion with your non-statistical planning. You need to plan. You need to communicate that what you are doing in an efficient way. Try to make that they understand how the trial goes on. You need an efficient software to perform the analysis and the simulation. The study protocol needs to be written very clearly so that uh, the, the different sites and the regulators can understand and and have they can uh, they their their cons concerns are properly addressed, and then of course the review boards um, uh, in different review boards on a site uh, can uh, be satisfied with with your trial. So as I say, the, it is very important that a, a statistician need to explain this in a very non-statistical term, and I we find. The DAG figure, this kind of uh, showing some of this kind of a mock dose escalation TC, which is adopted from a real, but it's a mock one, uh, would be very useful for trial team to see, okay, if I, you use a model approach, how things will go. And then definitely training is a key one. Need to continue the training among a statistician and non-statistician. And, uh, the, and, and role of a software is important to reduce the, and increase the efficiency of, and the overall timing of, of the protocol development. Here is another example. Here is an example of a protocol that is available actually online as well. Uh, you can take a look. So our the recommendation that I have is when you use such a design, don't dive into all the details into the protocol text. You rather keep it, uh, Simple in the protocol tech, go into the high level definition of the design model and how the decision process works into the main protocol body, and all of the rest can move into the appendix like details of the model, uh, your um, hypothetic scenario, simulation, those can come into the append statistical appendix so that the original protocol doesn't look very different if you from the traditional design. And it avoids the, the, the unnecessary technicalities, which maybe a non-statistical readers want to avoid. And then it's very important that in a dose escalation TC, it has to be clearly communicated what these results mean. So in terms of uh, posterior probabilities, that means what is the risk of DLT, should DLT now given the current data, what is the chance that I may have, I, I am in the target intervals and, and the, the plots that we have seen, also, the predictive things, like if we put four more patients, sometimes people ask this question to us that if I put four patients here, what is my, I mean, really, I don't know what true toxicity means. I mean, some, a non-statistician, I have an experience who asked me, okay, I don't know what true toxicity, true DLT probability really means. Can you tell me if I put four patients now into this dose level, what is the chance I will see two out of four toxicity? So such a thing, like, and that can be calculated using this model. And, and such, a, such a communications help to team to buy in and uh, understand this type of protocol. And of course, team need to uh, develop a strategy how to answer 
different sideboards and regulators. Honestly, this kind of questions were pretty common. More questions were common in five, six, seven years, five years ago, five, seven years ago. But now even regulators and review boards are pretty familiar now with model-based design. So my experience is this: the, 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 the alarm or the concerns are far lower at this moment. So just to do a quick summary, what we did right now. So we basically uh, talked about a uh, a practical model-based approach which uses a simple statistical model, but uses the all data together. And the those recommendations are done from a clinically intuitive metrics using probability risk assessment. But of course, uh, one need to understand that implementing implementation issues are very critical and once you plan it keep it on your plan very clearly that you need to convince many parties internal external clinician even trust me some of the statistician you enter into discussion why it is better than other why it's better than other so you basically need to make a communication plan the team need to put in that as is their timing and then the whole thing was having a open-minded collaboration to see what helps patient, how I can get a better dose, or how I can make a better dose decision for the next level. And then, of course, the, the, the design, the, the operating characteristic, um, prior derivation, and, and all other things uh, one needs to take care into the time window that how one can do that. And I, I would like to take this opportunity to help to, to acknowledge some of the my people who, uh, who, whom I work with, I have a pleasure and fortune to work with, and then uh, it's basically a, a, a humongous. Uh, they, they really were the path for me to, to, to move this forward and my learning process. I really want to acknowledge Dr. Biagno and Shonder uh, from Novartis, with whom I had, we have worked together hands in hands to implement this in a real life in my previous job, and then, of course, Simon Wandel. Dr. Stuart Bailey, um, who was the early development head on that time, then Dr. Kanan Natarajan, who was the head, now in Pfizer, Sandeep Menon, Roberto Bergerini in, in, a, in a Pfizer um, oncology group, early phase oncology group, Mike Branson from Bristol Myers Squibb, and numerous other statisticians and non statistician clinicians who really worked with us to make Innovatis and Pfizer, who make this trial support, uh, make this trial, make this thing happen in a real life trial. I really, the thank goes to all of them, what I present now. So, and thank you. For, and here are the few uh, references. If you're interested in more clinical references, I'm happy to provide those. And thank you for your attention. Over to you, Alisa. Thank you, Satyajit. So before we move into Q&A, we want to take a moment to remind you that EAST gives you easy access to a wide selection of trusted fixed and adaptive trial designs. EAST is used by nearly every major pharmaceutical company and the FDA. With a broad selection of popular designs in an easy to use format, we can help you quickly create and compare trial designs. Our company also offers a range of services from staff that act as an extension of your team and consulting services for more cutting edge projects to our new real world analytics capabilities we are here to help support your objectives. So now we're going to begin answering the questions submitted during today's presentation. So Satyajit, we have our first question here. If you have three provision doses, say 10, 20, 30, or 20 as your starting dose, is it fine to use MTPI instead of BLRM since we only have one escalation to make from 20 to 30? Yeah, I, I think the, my, my question would be uh, first. You may you you, you if you, you may have a data from from preclinical that you want to use. So I, I guess both method can be used here, but but definitely because your number of those levels are are small, uh, one need to be implement the BLRM carefully, especially choosing the priors and, and stuff very carefully. But uh, I I believe BLRM is still applicable, and and and, and later on. Because you start with three dose level, but maybe you end up with an intermediate dose level. So you never know when you begin the trial. You see something, and then maybe you wanted to explore something in the middle. So BLRM gives you such an such a, um, flexibility where MTPI uh, doesn't onto that. So I, I I would say if you only think about kind of an escalation, I mean both may be equally efficient if implemented properly. 
But I would prefer BLRM because it has still the flexibility of adding additional dose level if required. Thank you. And I believe we have time for just one more question here. Has Pfizer used the model-based approach as the default method in phase one dose escalation studies? By speaking of Pfizer, mostly they use model-based approaches. Yes. Answer. But I'm not... I'm not authorized to totally give the, the whole splitting how it works, but yes, I mean, the methods like 3 plus 3 are not used in Pfizer at all. Thank you. So um, here's our schedule of webinars. You can see we've had three webinars so far in this series, and we do have the recordings available um, on our uh, on our webpage, Cytel.com. And you'll see we have an upcoming webinar on July 15th. Our speaker, speaker will be Thomas Burnett, and he will be talking about population enrichment. So we hope to, to see you all there. And lastly, I'd like to thank you, Sajajit, for such a wonderful presentation. And thank you to everyone for attending today's webinar on practical model-based approaches for phase one oncology trials. So on behalf of Cytel, uh, we thank you for joining us today and hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you for inviting me, Elisa, and thank you everybody for joining.